Welcome back to Reality Asserts Itself on The Real News Network. I'm Paul Jay, and we're continuing our series about how do we get to a green economy with Bob Pollan. Thanks for joining us, Bob. So one more time, Bob is co-director, distinguished professor of economics at the Political Economy Research Institute, University of Massachusetts, Amherst. And he is the author of two reports on going green. One's called Global Green Growth, a forthcoming report with the United Nations Institute of Development Organization. So we've been talking about why we need to and what it might look like and watch the first segment and you'll know why and what. But now we're going to talk about what can we learn from other countries. So first of all, talk about some positive examples. Are there models in the world yes. that could be applied in North America that make some sense? There's a lot of positive evidence from other countries. So we could start with Germany. So Germany is a country that is roughly at the U.S. living standard. So they're not sacrificing anything. On the uh, whole, probably a little, in many ways, higher. Because... Well, yeah, roughly at the same. Um, in terms of what we talked about in the last uh, segment on energy efficiency, they're running their economy twice as efficiently as the United States. So this notion that you know, it, it's really hard for us to achieve efficiency gains is completely contradicted by the fact that Germany is running their economy today at twice the efficiency level of the United and have States. Have they sacrificed anything in terms of productivity? No. I mean, they're, they're running an economy at per capita GDP the same as us, as a higher level of product, average productivity growth that is much uh, more successful so in terms they get, of... So how'd they get there? Well, they're committed around issues of... Uh, starting again with energy efficiency. Uh, so the, the, you, you can operate the U.S. economy tomorrow at, at the German level of efficiency if we made the investments. Their buildings are way more efficient. Their cars are way more efficient. They use a lot more public transportation. And their machinery is more efficient because they, they think about it. Now, not only that, because, you know, the, one of the arguments is, well, how could we ever get to the German level? Well, not only uh, are they twice as efficient now, but their plan for 20 years is they are going to increase, they're going to double their level of efficiency over the next 20 years. So what's the big difference? Why was Germany able to do it and not here? Uh, two big things. One, they have, they've had a Green Party for 40 years. And I don't necessarily agree with everything the Green Party has done, but they have been successful. I mean, when they first got elected in the 1970s, they were a bunch of crazy hippies. That's how they were perceived. But they were in the Bundestag. They were, they were part of the political process, and they won. And they, what, I don't know the vote they get. It ranges 10, 15 percent. But they, they have uh, power. And that has forced the mainstream parties, no matter which mainstream party is in power, they do not openly defy the Green Party. And number two, they don't have any oil. No big oil companies. They don't. They're they're there, but they're not. They're not based in Germany. And Germany doesn't have the resources. So you don't have that resistance from the fossil fuel industry that you do in the United States. I would say those are the two big factors. Yeah. Well, in some ways, maybe the second, even the most prominent. I wouldn't underrate yeah, the first. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. Yeah. But they don't have the. And they don't have the Koch brothers and all the others like the Koch brothers actively fighting any kind of legislation. That's right. And I assume. The preponderance of Germans believe there actually is such a well, thing as climate change. Well, if you talk change. to you know anecdotally, as I've done, if you talk to Germans and if the, and if they say, you know what, it's going to cost us a thousand dollars a year to do this, which I don't necessarily think is true, and we can get into that. But they say, so what if it costs us a thousand dollars a year? We're a rich country, you know, on average, uh, we can afford a thousand dollars a year. I mean, there's a there's a uh, rural. Uh, town in Germany whose name I can't remember right now, um, they are operating on 100% green energy. And it wasn't because they were ultra greens. It was because they figured out by operating at high efficiency and relying on wind power, in their case primarily wind power, they could do everything they wanted. And they didn't have to spend a lot on uh, bringing uh, oil and bringing uh, utility-based electricity into the community. What are some other global examples? Uh, Brazil is another, uh, you know, Brazil is, you know, a, a great example. If we talk about the global situation, right now, uh, globally, er, on average, every person uh, emits or generates uh, 4.6 tons of CO2 per year. Now, of course, there's massive 
uh, differences, but on average, yeah, it's four because if you live eight. in the United States, you're doing a heck of a no, lot more. It, than the that. United States is 18. Okay, so but anyway, the average is 4.6. Brazil is at 2.4. Uh, Highly industrialized country. It's a it's a growing industrialized country. Now they have big advantages in that they have a lot of hydro resources and they utilize hydroelectric power. Uh, that's a big part of it. But they also are running an economy at a much higher level of efficiency than uh, the United States or other uh, newly industrializing for, countries. For example. Okay, so let's take another example. South Africa. No, stay with Brazil. What are they doing that's more efficient? Oh, well, the efficiency is not like any big deal. You have more efficient buildings. You have a more efficient transportation system. You have smaller cars. Uh, and you have more public transportation. Um, that's all there is to it. I mean, if the, if it would be relatively simple to put it in the building code. I mean, you have one thing is retrofitting, but there's very little. I don't know if there's anything in the building code that's actually assists on efficiency, is there? Well, no, there no, are, no, for, pu are for public buildings no, now. No, I mean, for private buildings. No, I mean, it's, you know, of course it varies by community, but the basic answer in is. In California, not. I think there is for public buildings. Is it, is, is it Well, national? public buildings, yes. In the, in the U.S. now, we do have standards. We are getting to more efficient buildings, but not efficient enough. Like I said, Germany's standard is zero emissions. And, and we can get there. Like I said, I myself am involved in putting up a building now in Amherst, Massachusetts, that will be zero. There's no reason why every new building can't be there. Yes, we have to think more. We have to spend more up front. But we're going to make it back within a couple of years. And, of course, if everybody does it, it gets a lot cheaper to do. Uh, uh, yeah, and then it just becomes part of common, you know, conventional wisdom, mm -hmm. how, how you put up a building. So South Africa. South Africa is really bad. Uh, South Africa is extremely inefficient, and they are very high emissions because they, uh, they rely on coal. They're a big coal exporter. They consume coal. Coal is the most dirty, burning fossil fuel. Uh, oil and natural gas are cleaner. They're not clean, but they're cleaner. So if you compare Brazil and South Africa, where in those two countries the per capita uh, per person GDP is roughly the same, um, Brazil is uh, on average, is uh, the average Brazilian is emitting 2.4 uh, tons per year. In South Africa, it's more like 14. And this is public policy, is the difference? Well, it, it I mean, is resources. I mean, you know, like I said, electric. hydro is big. But hydro can, small-scale hydro has a lot of promise. In, you know, people think hydro is a disaster because you put up these massive dams, you displace hundreds of thousands of people. That's not the only way you can do hydro. You can do smaller-scale hydro. Um, there's, for example, a lot of opportunity in India. Uh, India, small-scale hydro could be a major new resource, and renewable energy on average. So we're talking about hydro, solar, uh, wind, geothermal, and bio, clean uh, bioenergy. Um, their costs are now at close to parity with fossil fuels. Uh, solar is not, but the others, on average, you can put them up and run them, and nobody's sacrificing anything in terms of uh, the costs. Now, if you're talking globally, the, the other country that kind of really matters is China. What's going on? Okay, so China and the U.S. made this deal, you know, what, two weeks ago, that China promises that by 2030 they're going to cap their emissions. That is progress, but that's not nearly enough. The U.S. and China are responsible for 40% of all emissions. Okay, so yes, the rest of the world we've got to cover because that's 60%. But the U.S. and China both have to reduce their emissions by 40 percent within 20 years. And that's so it's China saying they're going to cap uh, in 20 years. So that's 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 not close to adequate. So, you know, China has to do it's the same thing. Invest a percent and a half of GDP per year in clean energy. In fact, China is investing significantly in clean energy, but they're exporting on the solar panels. They aren't keeping them yeah, in China. Yeah, they're like one of the world's leader in creation of solar panels. Yeah, but they need to build it out in, in China. And, uh, the, you know, in, in developing countries in China, in India, in Indonesia, in South Africa, in Brazil, 
the other factor is investing in clean energy is a big source of jobs. And the answer here, again, is very simple. It's because if you spend on the clean green energy economy, it requires more people and there's more domestic investment than if you rely on fossil fuels. But, but the other side of this, as you mentioned in the earlier segment, you can't just make buildings more efficient and start using alternative energy. You have to start reducing the use of carbon-based fuels. Yes. And, and China's arguing that for the foreseeable, you know, that 20, 25 years or whatever, you know, you guys have had like, you know, more than 100 years of industrial development right. and you're profiting from it and you're eating up the resources of the planet and you have the yes. highest standard of living. True, 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 true. And now true. you're telling us we have to get true, off fossil true, fuel true. before we get there. Yes, that's true. And it's not fair. So we have to think of some standards of fairness that uh, reflect the magnitude of the problem of uh, climate change. Again, if we take climate science seriously. So here's another example, Indonesia. So Indonesia, talking about levels of uh, emissions per person. Indonesia is at 1.7 tons per year per person. Again, the United States is at 18. Uh, China's at about six. Well, Indonesia's, they're saying, well, we want to grow like China. And you, know, you can't stop us, that's not fair. Uh, because their, you know, their standard of living is, you know, one tenth or one twelfth of the United States, and uh, yeah, by that measure of fairness, they're right. And, and this is the fight that keeps taking place at all the international right. meetings: but, is you rich countries have to subsidize this, or we can't do it. Right. But even so, take the case of Indonesia. If they grow as they intend to grow over the next twenty years, their uh, emissions per person is going to go up sixfold, and so. And then you take the Indonesian case and you spread it throughout Asia. Again, we have no chance whatsoever of, of stabilizing uh, the climate. So Indonesia also has to invest a percent and a half of GDP per year. Indonesia has massive resources but of and, geo... And start reducing their carbon use. It's not just the investment All side. of them. Look, and they're saying their development's going to slow down if they start reducing down. the carbon side. No, because... The only reason it would slow down is if it costs more or if, if you literally have your short of resources. Because resource. as you invest in the yeah. alternative yeah. energy side, you I'm, don't need so much I'm carbon. not going to say cut coal today. I'm going to say over 20 years, cut it by 40 percent. And as that happens, you substitute green energy and efficiency. And when you do that, the green energy is not going to cost more. It, you know, the, it's, at, it's at rough cost parity other than solar. And solar is coming down very, very quickly. And so over the next 20 years, solar will be at cost parity with fossil fuel, too. So there's no reason to sacrifice. And on the jobs front, again, Indonesia, like China, would be a massive source of net job creation after allowing that the fossil fuel industry is going to contract by 40 percent. So they've heard all these arguments. I don't think they have. That's why I'm on your show. All right. Well, maybe they're watching. Yeah. OK, we're going to pick this up. Uh, in the next segment, we're going to talk about, well, there's an alternative to what Bob's saying, and that's go nuclear in terms of uh, energy production and to carbon capture. This carbon stuff can be solved. It doesn't have to be so dirty. So we're going to see what he thinks of all that. Please join us for the continuation of Reality Asserts Itself on the Real News Network.